The Castle, A Parable by George MacDonald On the top of a high cliff, forming part of the base of a great mountain, stood a lofty castle. When or how it was built, no man knew, nor could anyone pretend to understand its architecture. Everyone who looked upon it felt that it was lordy and noble. And where one part seemed not to agree with another, the wise and modest dare not call them incongruous, but presume that the whole might be constructed on some higher principle of architecture than they yet understood. What helped them to this conclusion was that no one had ever seen the whole of the edifice, that even of the portion best known, some part or other was always wrapped in thick folds of mist from the mountain, and that when the sun shone upon this mist, the parts of the building that appeared through the vaporous veil were strangely glorified in their indistinctness, so that they seemed to belong to some aerial abode in the land of the sunset, and the beholders could hardly tell whether they had ever seen them before, or whether they were now, for the first time, partially revealed. Nor, although it was inhabited, could certain information be procured as to its internal construction. Those who dwelt in it often discovered rooms they had never entered before. Yea, once or twice, whole suites of apartments, of which only dim legends had been handed down from former times. Some of them expected to find one day secret places, filled with treasures of wondrous jewels, amongst which they hoped to light upon Solomon's ring, which for ages disappeared from the earth, but which had controlled the spirits, and the possession of which made a man simply what a man should be, the king of the world. Now and then, a narrow winding stair hitherto untrodden would bring them forth on a new turret, whence new prospects of the circumjacent country were spread out before them. How many more of these there might be, or how much loftier, no one could tell. Nor could the foundations of the castle and the rock on which it was built be determined with the smallest approach to precision. Those of the family who had given themselves to exploring in that direction found such a labyrinth of vaults and passages and endless successions of downgoing stairs out of one underground space into yet lower that they came to the conclusion that at least the whole mountain was perforated and honeycombed in this fashion. They had a dim consciousness, too, of the presence in those awful regions of beings whom they could not comprehend. Once they came upon the brink of a great black gulf, in which the eye could see nothing but darkness, they recoiled in horror. For the conviction flashed upon them that the gulf went down into the very central spaces of the earth, of which they had hitherto been wandering only in the upper crust. Nay, that the seething blackness before them had relations mysterious and beyond human comprehension with the far-off voids of space into which the stars dare not enter. At the foot of the cliff whereon the castle stood lay a deep lake, inaccessible save by a few avenues, being surrounded on all sides with precipices which made the water look very black, although it was as pure as the night sky. From a door in the castle, which was not to be otherwise entered, a broad flight of steps cut in the rock went down to the lake and disappeared below its surface. Some thought the steps went to the very bottom of the water. Now in this castle there dwelt a large family of brothers and sisters. They had never seen their father or mother. The younger had been educated by the elder, and these by an unseen care and ministration, about the sources of which they had, somehow or other, troubled themselves very little, for what people are accustomed to, they regard as coming from nobody, as if help and progress and joy and love were the natural crops of chaos or old night. But tradition said that one day, it was utterly uncertain when, their father would come and leave them no more, for he was still alive, though where he lived, nobody knew. In the meantime, all the rest had to obey their eldest brother and listen to his counsels. But almost all the family was very fond of liberty, as they called it, and liked to run up and down, hither and thither, roving about with neither law nor order, just as they pleased, so they could not endure their brother's tyranny, as they called it. At one time they said that he was only one of themselves, and therefore they would not obey him, 
at another that he was not like them and could not understand them, and therefore they would not obey him. Yet sometimes, when he came and looked them full in the face, they were terrified and dared not disobey, for he was stately and stern and strong. Not one of them loved him heartily, except the eldest sister, who was very beautiful and silent, and whose eyes shone as if light lay somewhere deep behind them. Even she, although she loved him, thought him very hard sometimes, for when he had once said a thing plainly, he could not be persuaded to think it over again. So even she forgot him sometimes, and went her own ways, and enjoyed herself without him. Most of them regarded him as a sort of watchman, whose business it was to keep them in order, and so they were indignant and disliked him. Yet they all had a secret feeling that they ought to be subject to him, and after any particular act of disregard, None of them could think with any peace of the old story about the return of their father to his house. But indeed, they never thought much about it, or about their father at all. For how could those who cared so little for their brother, whom they saw every day, care for their father, whom they had never seen? One chief cause of complaint against him was that he interfered with their favorite studies and pursuits, whereas he only sought to make them give up trifling with earnest things, and seek for truth and not for amusement from the many wonders around them. He did not want them to turn to other studies or to eschew pleasures, but in those studies to seek the highest things most, and other things in proportion to their true worth and nobleness. This could not fail to be distasteful to those who did not care for what was higher than they. And so matters went on for a time, and they thought they could do better without their brother and their brother knew that they could not do it all without him, and tried to fulfill the charge committed into his hands. At length, one day, for the thought seemed to strike them simultaneously, they conferred together about giving a great entertainment in their grandest rooms to any of their neighbors who chose to come, or indeed to any inhabitants of the earth or air who would visit them. They were too proud to reflect that some company might defile even the dwellers in which was undoubtedly the finest palace on the face of the earth. But what made the thing worse was that the old tradition said that the rooms were to be kept entirely for the use of the owner of the castle. And indeed, whenever they entered them, such was the effect of their loftiness and grandeur upon their minds that they always thought of the old story and could not help believing it. Nor would the brother permit them to forget it now, but, appearing suddenly amongst them, when they had no expectation of being interrupted by him, he rebuked them, both for the indiscriminate nature of their invitation and for the intention of introducing anyone, not to speak of some who would doubtless make their appearance on the evening in question, into the rooms kept sacred for the use of the unknown father. But by this time their talk with each other had so excited their expectations of enjoyment which had previously been strong enough, that anger sprung up within them at the thought of being deprived of their hopes. And they looked at each other in the eyes, and the look said, We are many, and he is one. Let us get rid of him, for he is always finding fault and thwarting us in the most innocent pleasures, as if we would wish to do anything wrong. So without a word spoken, they rushed upon him, and although he was stronger than any of them, and struggled hard at first, Yet they overcame him at last. Indeed, some of them thought he yielded to their violence long before they had mastery of him, and this very submission terrified the more tender-hearted among them. However, they bound him, carried him down many stairs, and having remembered an iron staple in the wall of a certain vault with a thick rusty chain attached to it, they bore him thither and made the chain fast around him. There they left him, shutting the great gnarring brazen door of the vault as they departed for the upper regions of the castle. Now all was in a tumult of preparation. Everyone was talking of the coming festivity, but no one spoke of the deed they had done. A sudden paleness overspread the face, now of one and now of another, but it passed away, and no one took notice of it. They only plied the task of the moment the more energetically. Messengers were sent far and near, not to individuals or families, but publishing in all places of concourse a general invitation to any who chose to come on a certain day and partake for certain succeeding days 
of the hospitality of the dwellers in the castle. Many were the preparations immediately begun for complying with the invitation, but the noblest of their neighbors refused to appear, not from pride, but because of the unsuitableness and carelessness of such a mode. With some of them, it was an old condition in the tenure of their estates that they should go to no one's dwelling except visited in person and expressly solicited. Others, knowing what sorts of persons would be there and that, from a certain physical antipathy, they could scarcely breathe in their company, made up their minds at once not to go. Yet multitudes, many of them beautiful and innocent as well as gay, resolved to appear. Meanwhile, the great rooms of the castle were got in readiness. That is, they proceeded to deface them with decorations, for there was a solemnity and stateliness about them in their ordinary condition, which was at once felt to be unsuitable for the light-hearted company so soon to move about in them with the same self-carelessness with which men walk abroad within the great heavens and hills and clouds. One day, while the workmen were busy, the eldest sister, of whom I have already spoken, happened to enter. She knew not why. Suddenly, the great idea of the mighty halls dawned upon her and filled her soul. The so-called decorations vanished from her view, and she felt as if she stood in her father's presence. She was at once elevated and humbled. As suddenly the idea faded and fled, and she beheld the gaudy festoons and draperies and paintings which disfigured the grandeur, she wept and sped away. Now it was too late to interfere, and things must take their course. She would have been but a Cassandra prophetess to those who saw but the pleasure before them. She had not been present when her brother was imprisoned, and indeed for some days had been so wrapped in her own business that she had taken but little heed of anything that was going on. But they all expected her to show herself when the company was gathered, and they applied to her for advice at various times during their operations. At length, the expected hour arrived, and the company began to assemble. It was a warm summer evening. The dark lake reflected the rose-colored clouds in the west, and through the flush rode many gaily painted boats, with various colored flags, toward the massy rock on which the castle stood. The trees and flowers seemed already asleep, and breathing forth their sweet dream breath. Laughter and low voices rose from the breast of the lake to the ears of the youths and maidens, looking forth expectant from the lofty windows. They went down to the broad platform at the top of the stairs in front of the door to receive their visitors. By degrees, the festivities of the evening commenced. The same smiles flew forth both at eyes and lips, darting like beams through the gathering crowd. Music from unseen sources now rolled in billows, now crept in ripples through the sea of air that filled the lofty rooms. And in the dancing halls, when hand took hand, and form and motion were molded and swayed by the indwelling music, it governed not these alone, but as the ruling spirit of the place, every new burst of music for a new dance swept before it a new and accordant odor, and dyed the flames that glowed in the lofty lamps with a new and accordant stain. The floors bent beneath the feet of the time-keeping dancers, but twice in the evening some of the inmates started and the pallor occasionally common to the household overspread their faces, for they felt underneath them a counter-motion to the dance, as if the floor rose slightly to answer their feet, and all the time their brother lay below in the dungeon, like John the Baptist in the castle of Herod, when the lords and captains sat around and the daughter of Herodias danced before them. Outside, all around the castle, brooded the dark night unheeded, for the clouds had come up from all sides and were crowding together overhead. In the unfrequent pauses of the music, they might have heard now and then the gusty rush of a lonely wind coming and going, no one could know whence or whither, born and dying, unexpected and unregarded. But when the festivities were at their height, when the external and passing confidence, which is produced between the superficial natures by a common pleasure, was at the full, a sudden crash of thunder quelled the music, as the thunder quells the noise of the uplifted sea. The windows were driven in, and torrents of rain carried in the folds of a rushing wind poured into the halls, 
the lights were swept away, and the great rooms, now dark within, were darkened yet more by the dazzling shoots of flame from the vault of blackness overhead. Those that ventured to look out the windows saw, in the blue brilliancy of the quick-following jets of lightning, the lake at the foot of the rock, ordinarily so still and so dark, lighted up, not on the surface only, but down to half its depth, so that, as it tossed in the wind like a tortured sea of writhing flames or incandescent half-molten serpents of brass, they could not tell whether a strong phosphorescence did not issue from the transparent body of the waters, as if the earth and the sky lighted together, one consenting source of flaming utterance. Sad was the condition of the late plastic mass of living form that had flowed into shape at the will and law of the music. Broken into individuals, the common transfusing spirit withdrawn, they stood drenched, cold, and benumbed, with clinging garments. Light, order, harmony, purpose departed, and chaos restored. The issuings of life turned back on their sources, chilly and dead, and in every heart reigned that falsest of despairing convictions that this was the only reality, and that was but a dream. The eldest sister stood with clasped hands and downbent head, shivering and speechless, as if wanting for something to follow. Nor did she wait long. A terrible flash and thunder peal made the castle rock, and in the pausing silence that followed, her quick sense heard the rattling of a chain far off, deep down, and soon the sound of heavy footsteps, accompanied with the clanking of iron, reached her ear. She felt that her brother was at hand. Even in the darkness and amidst the bellowing of another deep-bosomed cloud monster, she knew that he had entered the room. A moment after, a continuous pulsation of angry blue light began, which lasting for some moments, revealed him standing amidst them. Gaunt, haggard, and motionless, his hair and beard untrimmed, his face ghastly, his eyes large and hollow, the light seemed to gather around him as a center. Indeed, some believed that it throbbed and radiated from his person, and not from the stormy heavens above them. The lightning had rent the wall of his prison and released the iron staple of his chain, which he had wound about him like a girdle. In his hand he carried an iron fetter bar, which he had found on the floor of the vault. More terrified at his aspect than at all the violence of the storm, the visitors, with many a shriek and cry, rushed out into the tempestuous night. By degrees the storm died away and its last flash revealed the forms of the brothers and sisters lying prostrate with their faces on the floor and that fearful shape standing motionless amidst them still. Morning dawned, and there they lay, and there he stood. But at a word from him, they arose and went about their various duties, though listlessly enough. The eldest sister was the last to rise, and when she did... It was only by a terrible effort that she was able to reach her room, where she fell again on the floor. There she remained lying for days. The brother caused the doors of the great suites of the room to be closed, leaving them just as they were, with all the childish adornment scattered about and the rain still falling in through the shattered windows. Thus let them lie, said he, till the rain and the frost have cleansed them of paint and drapery. No storm can hurt the pillars and arches of these halls. The hours of this day went heavily. The storm was gone, but the rain was left. The passion had departed, but the tears remained behind. Dull and dark, the low misty clouds brooded over the castle and the lake and shut out all the neighborhood. Even if they had climbed to the loftiest known turret, they would have found it swathed in a garment of clinging vapor, affording no refreshment to the eye and no hope to the heart. There was one lofty tower that rose sheer a hundred feet above the rest, and from which the fog could have been seen lying in a gray mass beneath, but that tower they had not yet discovered, nor another close beside it, the top of which was never seen, nor could be, 
for the highest clouds of heaven clustered continually around it. The rain fell continuously, though not heavily without, and within, too, there were clouds from which dropped the tears which are the rain of the Spirit. All of the good life seemed for the time departed, and their souls lived but as leafless trees that had forgotten the joy of summer, and whom no wind prophetic of spring had yet visited. They moved about mechanically, and had not strength enough left to wish to die. The next day the clouds were higher, and a little wind blew through such loopholes in the turrets as the false improvements of the inmates had not yet filled with glass, shutting out as the storm, so the serene visitings of the heavens. Throughout the day the brother took various opportunities of addressing a gentle command, now to one and now to another of his family. It was obeyed in silence. The wind blew fresher through the loopholes and the shattered windows of the great rooms, and it found its way by unknown passages to faces and eyes hot with weeping. It cooled and blessed them. When the sun arose the next day, it was a clear sky. By degrees, everything fell into the regularity of subordination. With the subordination came increase of freedom. The steps of the more youthful of the family were heard on the stairs and in the corridors more light and quick than ever before. Their brother had lost the terrors of aspect produced by his confinement, and his commands were issued more gently and oftener with a smile than in all their previous history. By degrees, his presence was universally felt through the house. It was no surprise to any one at his studies to see him by his side when he lifted up his eyes, though he had not before known that he was in the room. And although some dread still remained, it was rapidly vanishing before the advances of a firm friendship. Without immediately ordering their labors, he always influenced them and often altered their direction and objects. The change soon evident in the household was remarkable. A simpler, nobler expression was visible on all the countenances. The voices of the men were deeper and yet seemed by their very depth more feminine than before while the voices of the women were softer and sweeter and at the same time more full and decided. Now the eyes had often an expression as if their sight was absorbed in the gaze of the inward eyes, and when the eyes of two met, there passed between those eyes the utterance of a conviction that both meant the same thing. But the change was, of course, to be seen more clearly, though not more evidently, in individuals. One of the brothers, for instance, was very fond of astronomy. He had his observatory on a lofty tower which stood pretty clear of the others, toward the north and east. But hitherto, his astronomy, as he had called it, had been more of the character of astrology. Often, too, he might have been directing a heaven-searching telescope to catch the rapid transit of a fiery shooting star, belonging altogether to the earthly atmosphere and not the serene heavens. He had to learn that the signs of the air are not the signs of the skies. Nay, once his brother surprised him in the act of examining through his longest tube a patch of burning heath upon a distant hill. But now he was diligent from morning till night in the study of the laws of the truth that have to do with the stars. And when the curtain of the sunlight was about to rise from before the heavenly worlds, which it had hidden all day long, he might be seen preparing his instruments with the solemn countenance with which it becometh one to look into the mysterious harmonies of nature. Now he learned what law and order and truth are, what consent and harmony mean, how the individual may find his own end in a higher end, where law and freedom mean the same thing, and the purest certainty exists without the slightest constraint. Thus he stood on earth, and he looked to the heavens." Another, who had been much given to searching out the hollow places and recesses in the foundation of the castle, and who was often to be found with compass and ruler working away at a chart of the same which he had been in process of constructing, now came to the conclusion that only by ascending the upper regions of his abode could he become capable of understanding what lay beneath, and that, in all probability, One clear prospect from the top of the highest attainable turret over the castle as it lay below would reveal more of the idea of its internal construction than a year spent in wandering through its subterranean vaults. 
But the fact was that the desire to ascend wakening within him had made him forget what was beneath, and having laid aside his chart for a time at least, he was now to be met in every quarter of the upper parts, searching and striving upward, now in one direction, now in another, and seeking as he went the best outlooks into the clear air of outer realities. And they began to discover that they were all mediating different aspects of the same thing, and they all brought together their various discoveries and recognized the likeness between them, and the one thing often explained the other, and combining with it helped to a third. They grew in consequence more and more friendly and loving, so that every now and then, one turned to another and said, as in surprise, Why, you are my brother. Why, you are my sister. And yet they had always known it. The change reached to all. One who lived on the air of sweet sounds and who was almost always to be found seated by her harp or some other instrument had, till the late storm, been generally merry and playful, though sometimes sad. But for a long time after that, she was often found weeping and playing little simple airs which she had heard in childhood, backward longings followed by fresh tears. Before long, however, a new element manifested itself in her music. It became yet more wild and sometimes retained all of its sadness, but it was mingled with anticipation and hope. The past and the future merged in one, and while memory yet brought the rain cloud, expectation threw the rainbow across its bosom, and all was uttered in her music, which rose and swelled, now to defiance, now to victory, then died in a torrent of weeping. As to the eldest sister, it was many days before she recovered from the shock. At length, one day, her brother came to her, took her by the hand, led her to an open window, and told her to seat herself by it and look out. She did so, but at first saw nothing more than the unsympathizing blaze of sunlight. But as she looked, the horizon widened out and the dome of the sky ascended, till the grandeur seized upon her soul and she fell on her knees and wept. Now the heaven seemed to bend lovingly over her and to stretch out wide cloud arms to embrace her. The earth lay like the bosom of an infinite love beneath her, and the wind kissed her cheek with an odor of roses. She sprang to her feet and turned in an agony of hope, expecting to behold the face of her father, but there stood only her brother, looking calmly though lovingly on her emotion. She turned again to the window, on the hilltops rested the sky, heaven and earth were one, and the prophecy awoke in her soul that from betwixt them would the steps of the Father approach. Hitherto she had seen but beauty, but now she beheld truth. Often she had looked on such clouds as these and loved the strange ethereal curves into which the winds molded them, and had smiled as her little pet sister told her what curious animals she saw in them and tried to point them out to her. Now they were as troops of angels, jubilant over her new birth, for they sang in her soul of beauty and truth and love. She looked down, and her little sister knelt beside her. She was a curious child, with black glittering eyes and dark hair, at the mercy of every wandering wind, a frolicsome, daring girl who laughed more than she smiled. She was generally in attendance on her sister and was always finding and bringing her strange things. She never pulled a primrose, but she knew the haunts of all the orcas tribe and brought from them bees and butterflies innumerable as offerings to her sister. Curious moths and glowworms were her greatest delight, and she loved the stars because they were like glowworms. But the change had affected her too, for her sister saw that her eyes had lost their glittering look and had become more liquid and transparent. And from that time, she often observed that her gaiety was more gentle and her smile more frequent, her laugh less bell-like. And although she was as wild as ever, there was more elegance in her motions and more music in her voice. And she clung to her sister with far greater fondness than before. The land reposed in the embrace of the warm summer days. The clouds of heaven nestled around the towers of the castle and the hearts of its inmates became conscious of a warm atmosphere, of a presence of love. They began to feel like the children of a household when the mother is at home. 
Their faces and forms grew daily more and more beautiful, till they wondered as they gazed on each other. They were often visited, especially the eldest sister, by sounds that no one heard by themselves, issuing from woods and waters, and by forms of love that lightened out of flowers and grass and great rocks. Now and then the young children would come in with a slow, stately step, and with great eyes that looked as if they would devour all the creation, say that they had met the Father amongst the trees, and that he had kissed them. And, added one of them once, I grew so big. But then others went out to look, and they could see no one. And some said it must have been the brother, who grew more and more beautiful and loving and reverend, and who had lost all traces of hardness, so that they wondered they could ever have thought him stern and harsh. But the eldest sister held her peace, and looked up, and her eyes filled with tears. Who can tell, thought she, but the little children know more about it than we? Often at sunrise might be heard their hymn of praise to their unseen father, whom they felt to be near, though they saw him not. Some words thereof once reached my ear through the folds of the music in which they floated, as in an upward snowstorm of sweet sounds. And these are some of the words I heard, but there was much I seemed to hear which I could not understand, and some things which I understood but I cannot utter again. We thank thee that we have a father and not a maker, that thou hast begotten us and not molded us as images of clay, that we have come forth of thy heart, and we have not been fashioned by thy hands. It must be so. Only the heart of a father is able to create. We rejoice in it and bless thee that we know it. We thank thee for thyself. Be what thou art, our root and life, our beginning and end, are all in all. Come home to us. Thou livest, therefore we live. In thy light we see. Thou art. That is all our song. Thus they worship and love and wait. Their hope and expectation grow ever stronger and brighter. That one day, ere long, the Father will show himself amongst them, and henceforth dwell in his own house forevermore. What was once an old legend has become the one desire of their hearts, and the loftiest hope is the surest of being fulfilled.